Okay. This is CC. Yeah. Can, we ask, can we ask a quick question before we jump into the milestones? When you're, sure, showing, sure. All the, when you're showing all the degree audit, kind of that piece of things, where are you pulling that data from? Are you assuming you're going to be pulling that from a degree audit system, or do you have a homegrown system? Where are you assuming we, that that information comes from? We are working with uh, DARS and UACHIEVE, and those are both, in, in case somebody, not everybody's familiar with this, there's a company, College Source, who developed DARS some years ago, and DARS is uh, essentially the program that's built on top of, and it comes with a mainframe database. Do you call it a, a database? You don't, you just call it a mainframe. No? For, for, yeah. So, yeah, so for, for, any of, for those of you who attended the program assessment module, or, any, or some of our other presentations around enrollment overview, recall that even though an ultimate goal of college student is to build a degree audit system for in the purposes of enrollment out of the box, we are going to be integrating with UAchieve, so the product that UW uses. So the assumption is, be it for my plan and for enrollment, is that out of the box it'll integrate directly with UAchieve. It's reading all those program audit rules directly from UAchieve. Okay, thank you. Yep. And so we're Sorry, Jill, you want to do something else? <laughs> no, no, that was perfect, thank you. I needed help there. <laughs> I, I know that you achieved... When you said mainframe database, I figured it was time to jump in. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, 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 I was like, what do you call mainframe? <laughs> anyway, so back on, back on track. Um, we're working through, you know, if, if you achieve has this data available, let's show that field, and if it doesn't have that data available, default back to this one, knowing that I think each uh, configuration or use of you achieve can really vary across universities. So we're, we're really right. trying to do our analysis and how does UW have it set it up, set up, but then how are other institutions likely to have this set up so that our report um, isn't necessarily just going to break automatically when, when somebody else tries to right. use that. And everybody keep in mind this is being built on the quality stack and, and the, the uh, lead dev for my plan is Kamal, who many of you probably not University of Toronto because I think he already cycled off, but he, he was an integral part of the service team on, on quality student for many years. So he's a, this is a very, a very cross-fertilized effort. <laughs> yeah, he's anyway, pretty wonderful too. Cool. Yep. All right, so um, audit and explore. We have those together, uh, and, and explore for my plan really means uh, being able to search programs and see what those, what their requirements are. And as we display program requirements, we want to make sure that we're not showing manually entered requirements, but we're going to, we're planning on actually using the output from you achieve to show, you know, uh, what the program requires either to be admitted into the program or to graduate, really to try to keep that data as consistent as possible. You can imagine if a student is searching for different programs, they may go to a detailed page about that course, and down at the bottom of the page that we would include uh, information about admission requirements or program requirements that wouldn't be fine-tuned to that student, they would just be general. And that would allow prospective students to go ahead in and, and see those. Um, so this will be... You know, and I guess in this milestone, not just the output of here's your audit, but then also recommended courses, uh, pulling out any sort of navigation to finding courses based on program requirements, um, looking at programs. What we won't be able to do this year is to allow students to pull up a couple of programs and compare those. You know, which of these would allow, you know, uh, how many more credits would I need to complete for this one versus that one? Uh, any of that type of comparison for year one, they're going to need to be able, need to do manually. Um, so we're trying to set up the, the audit output um, as consistent as possible so that students are able to at least do a visual check and do that comparison in their head. Um, I just bring up the comparison piece because I know that in our student research that that was something that they were, uh, several students voiced a strong interest in. Um, one of the things that we won't be doing 
right away is this idea of an academic progress dashboard, uh, primarily because in you achieve, unless you go through and indicate what category a particular requirement is set in, uh, there's no way to roll that up. So that's one of those pieces that will be very university specific and we're, and we're kind of trying to work through what information can we roll up at a high level based on how the, the data is set up. Um, so th we'll move on from audit and explore into manage a plan and that's really the meat of, of my plan when you think of having an academic plan where you're adding those courses to a quarter. And the wireframes that Carol was showing before really showed those. I, I take a course, I add it to a quarter, it tells me whether or not I'm, as far as, it, it won't get into eligibility, where am I really eligible to take this course, but it would look at, have you completed the courses required before this, or are there co-requisites and things along those lines, we'd want to give that feedback to the students and alert them, not prevent them from adding them to a given quarter, but hey, you, should, you need to take English 101 before you take 200, something along those lines. And that's, uh, Jill, that's using uh, requisites from curriculum management, is that correct? That is, I, yes, I believe so. Yeah. We, we have data coming from so many different places that I would just quit answering. And then as we go from there, uh, then we want to allow students to be able to share that plan with their advisor. Uh, and you know, we're working through the, the access rules right now at the University of Washington. Um, can we share these plans with all advisors as one large pool? Um, and that decision is really still yet to be made. There, there's all sorts of complexity as we get into um, access. Uh, but anyway, and then the, the other bullet that I have here is really just integrating, and this is something that's going to be very UW specific, but integrating with, with existing systems that advisors use. We don't want to give them yet another tool that they have to log into. Uh, advisors will be able to go in and create comments. Uh, this will be a critical place where we allow for email notifications. Obviously, if an advisor leaves a student a comment, that student better get an email. Otherwise, they're just not going to know that something's left there. Um, and so we're, our target is to finish significant development, especially on back-end code, by July 16th to make sure that we have uh, eight weeks to go through test final pieces, any of the visual design that hasn't been completed yet, uh, elements of global navigation, final usability testing, training of our advisors, um, some of the support documentation. There's quite a few things that we need to just wrap up and make sure are all set. And uh, August 28th is our target release. Um, the final thing I could talk about is what we're looking at for year two. That'd be great. Carol, do you? Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. So just, you know, I think to sort of circle back to what, we, what I presented earlier, I mean, at the end of year one, there'll be significant components of what we on the quality student side have conceptualized around learning plan and academic planning. Absolutely. So pretty exciting to see. Yeah. Um, so what I've got here is just a list of some, uh, some features that have been prioritized for year two. There's obviously some work of just completing or, or enhancing some of the features that we've already started, but here's a list of some new items and this list is taken from uh, a proposal that went to our student technology fee here at the University of Washington. Uh, one exciting piece about this project is that it's being created for students, paid for by students, there's students on our team, so it's extremely student focused. Uh, the advisor facing piece uh, will be, you know, that's not the emphasis for what my plan is. Um, Though there's, there's obviously really important components uh, for advisors that we need to make sure are ready before this, this is deployed uh, so that they don't have an increased workload. Anyway, so um, the first one, I think I mentioned this before, was the comparison of program requirements across multiple majors. Uh, we've brainstormed uh, some neat wizards that might come along with this and um, even the ability to see what are some easy to, to get minors. Uh, but really the core of this is here's two or three programs that I'm considering and based on what I've already done, 
or based on my performance with other students or you know just using the data for a couple of different ways to give a student feedback of could I graduate with this in time um, and we're really seeing this scenario being both for pre-major undergraduates but potentially also the junior uh, who is finding that they aren't probably going to be able to graduate su successfully and so they need to come up with a holy crap plan what do I do now I'm in trouble <laughs> Um, so then the next one would be ability for students to develop and maintain a backup plan. We are setting up the infrastructure so that they can do this, but we're not setting up the UI for year one. So then we'll come back and, and consider all of that. And the complexity got into if an advisor leaves a comment on a plan, does it need to be attached to a particular state and a particular plan? And we started working through some of the details on that and uh, certainly don't want to get it wrong. So we're going we're gonna to circle back on that year two. Uh, something that I think is really huge for the graduate school as well as undergraduates, but is this idea of an advisor creates a plan and then shares that out with students. You can think of a department where, like I know that the MBA program at the University of Washington, all of the students for the first year take the same exact courses. So why not create that plan, push it out, and then students you know, essentially take that and either edit it or, or take it wholesale. Um, and the plans, the next one would be plan for non-course activities. Um, I'm not sure entirely how we're going to bring this in, but we need to bring in the ability for either study abroad internships. Um, and I, I think that uh, the value for this also spans undergraduate and graduate. Uh, Pre-registration planning, any of the section information, um, and I think I was mentioning this earlier, the ability to filter by courses that happen after 10 a.m., but you know, I think we've got a lot of students where they know they're taking, um, they'll be working particular hours, or they've already found a course that they have to take in this time frame, so they want to find courses that would fit around that. Uh, we have a really um, uh, limited tool at the University of Washington that's a, a schedule finder, schedule builder type of, of, of um, functionality that doesn't really meet the needs of students because uh, it kind of gives them the wrong idea about what they're able to take. So I think we've got a lot of um, opportunity as we start looking at both not just what are your requirements and which courses should you take and, and what are the prerequisite rules, but then that registration planning of just when is a course held as we overlap those two bits of information. I think we're giving the students a lot better feedback, not just about when can you take it, but should I be taking this course or not, and can I take it or not. Um, and then finally, the pre-registration section watch list. Um, I just, I kind of giggle. Watch list was, was a phrase that I recommended, and then we had somebody I thought say it really well. I was like, watch list? Is, is that like a list of courses that are not allowed to fly? Um, you know, like a, yeah. so it, it's probably a little too sinister, but still that idea of uh, I, I'm tracking some courses, and I just want to, or I'm actually tracking specific sections, and I want to know when those are available. Um, I don't know about other universities, but I know that we have, there are uh, robot programs that uh, watch for sections to be available and send information out to students and students pay a nominal fee to get that information. So it's obviously a valuable value for them if they're paying for it. And so that's something that we'd want to look at. Um, I think the quote was, kill the robot. <laughs> well, I think what's beautiful about what I'm seeing outlined for year two and you know a lot of the pieces in year one, um, so backing up a little bit, the search for finding courses and programs, finding courses that meet certain requirements, be they gen ed or, or other requirements, um, that's all functionality that we had planned for enrollment and seeing it already built out. I mean, this is the beauty of, of the community source model, right? <laughs> we have a contribution that potentially can come back in so that we don't have to necessarily build out yet another view of a search and selective courses. Same thing, what you're describing around Schedule Builder for finding, you know, what you're called pre-registration planning is exactly what we were conceiving of in terms of Schedule Builder. So it's just really nice to see the, the community source model at work. <laughs> Perhaps it will motivate others on this call. <laughs> yeah, it looks good, Jill. Thank you. 
true. I think that's all I got today. It. <laughs> well, it's a much happier note to end on than my, we're not doing learning plan, anyone. Um, so let's maybe talk a little bit about uh, contribution. And so <clears throat> Jill, Darcy, and I have been talking um, about potential contribution models as in when this would be available to the community. And uh, there's a couple different models. Um, it could be that it goes to, um, that UW makes it available and supports it, that it goes to core and then therefore quality students supports it, um, that it might just be released to, to partners. So there's a couple different models that we're considering. And I, I think it's probably um, much too early <laughs> to know. Um, I think as we get into summer, and we get some testing data back and um, involved from the technical side of the house in terms of evaluating evaluating the code, et cetera, will have a much clearer indication. But, um, but it's definitely you know, conversations we're having about when and how we can make this available more broadly. Carol, I just don't really have any answers yet. Absolutely, please. No, I, I think the one thing that we're, we're clear on is that uh, moving to year two for the My Plan development team is so critical to the success of the project that we, after year one, likely will not be able to support a full contribution, you know, where we, we give it back to the community and then we are spending time supporting that contribution. And, and, unless there's some sort of creative rework with resources or, you know, so I think that, you know, we're anticipating looking at a year two fully supported contribution, uh, and that if there was a university that was really interested and wanted to see this after year one, and that really was strategically critical for them, then we'd have to try to figure out a solution um, mm -hmm. on how to do that. I, I think that's the, the idea. I'm sort of representing what other people have said. Sounds good. Cool. So any questions for Jill? A remarkably quiet audience today. Um, OK, so, uh, so that's uh, where we are with academic planning. Um, I think you know, most will be, again, just to summarize, on the, from the quality student enrollment perspective, very little in the way of academic planning, but um, I think we'll see much of the functionality we originally envisioned being fulfilled via this contribution. So we're all pretty excited about that. Um, the, so that is the, that's the tenth of our ten functional areas: academic planning. Um, just to note that the follow-up date for this module has been moved out a week, and I apologize for having to do that. Um, we rescheduled when functional council is being held, and this, these follow-up sessions bump up against functional council, and I, I canceled last functional council, and I, I can't cancel the next one. So instead of meeting February um, 16th, uh, we will meet February 23rd, so um, two weeks from tomorrow as opposed to one week from tomorrow for the follow-up date. And I, I hope that doesn't uh, cause anybody too much conflict, but um, it's necessary. Uh, post your questions, as always, in the Google Doc, and there's another evaluation. And um, I guess I would just like to thank the audience very much, those of you who've attended all the modules. Um, I really also want to take my, thank my team <laughs> for all the time and energy that they put into um, making these trainings happen. I hope you found them useful and helpful. And um, that's it for <laughs> <laughs> We're signing off today. <laughs> for uh, this is the last of the module, so um, they're obviously available. Uh, they've been all taped, um, so they're all available. You can watch them over and over if you if you need to. But um, that's it. I I, uh, I have no more parting words other than to say thank you very much. I've appreciated your attendance at these and enjoyed doing them. And um, I'll take any last questions. Thanks, Carol. Share the YouTube videos with your friends and enemies. <laughs> yeah, and thanks very much to Cheryl for all her help with the logistics making this happen. So, 
All right. So we'll see you on the 23rd for follow-up. And, um, and in the meantime, feel free to contact me with any questions. And um, we'll see you then. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.